And the gift that we have in being able to sow into good soil. We thank you for the good soil. We pray that we continue to enjoy the blessing of good, fertile soil from which we will reap an abundant harvest in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I just want to quickly touch on uh, the St. Augustine uh, thing that we're going to. Um, I, I want to in encourage you to come out to that thing. It's a lot of fun, especially for the families. We take over the whole cart. Uh, we've taken over the whole cart, and we sing, and we, we just take over. And, and people actually say, I want to go on their cart. It's amazing the, 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 because we, we sing Christmas carols, and we, we, we have a good time. That's what we're there to do, and we have fun. And so I want to encourage you to come out to that thing. It's a lot of fun with a family. All right, so uh, we've been talking about the faithfulness of God. Say with me, the faithfulness of God. Faithfulness. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is faithful. God is faithful. Say, say it like you believe it. God is faithful. God. He's faithful, folks. One of the biggest things the devil tries to do, and that's when fear grips our hearts, is he tries to question, put into question the faithfulness of God. You think about it. When we get into fear, we're doubting his faithfulness. Right? We're doubting his faithfulness to our process. Remember, we talked about that two, two three weeks ago, that even when we're in our process, he is faithful to us to make sure that his word comes to pass. And, and we know that all, how many things? All things work together for our good. And so he's faithful to the process. We saw that two weeks ago. I'm just doing a quick little recap. And so we need to be aware that the enemy's job, what does he do? He tries to steal the word out of us so that we do, don't keep believing in, in his word. And one of the ways he's going to do that, he's going to use fear. And he's going to try and put doubt in your mind that God is faithful to you, not pastor so-and-so, not evangelist so-and-so, but to you while you're going through your process. We're all going through different processes right now, whether we're believing for health, whether we're believing for finances, whether we're believing for something in the family, whether we're believing for something in the business. We all are believing for something, and we're trusting the Lord for something, right? And so while I am in that state of believing, it's called my I'm going to say it in American. It's my process. It's my process. It's my process, and I need to know that while I'm going through it, not just when I get to the end destination, but even in my process, God is with me, and He's leading me through my process, and He's faithful to me even while I'm going through this. Oh, turn to the person next to you and say, I can go home already, but you're not going home. All right, so he's faithful to us in the process. Secondly, we saw that he's faithful to us in his promises. God is faithful to his word. He watches over his word to perform it in our lives. Now, the thing that you're holding on to, the word that you're holding on to, if the word you're holding on to is that you're a loser, everything's going to come to naught, um, things are going to be destroyed, things are going to be broken, things are going to be lost. If that's what you're holding on to, the, the, the thing that you have feared has come upon you, will come upon you. The chances of it coming upon you are very good because not just are you believing it, but you're probably going to be speaking it. You have what you say, Amen. right? I mean, this principle doesn't just work for Christians. It even works for non-believers. In fact, it, it works for human beings. Why? Because we were created in his likeness and in his image. You say, well, pastor, uh, it, uh, give me an example. Well, how many of you uh, remember a, a, a boxer? And those of you that are a little too young for this, Google it. That's what we do, right? Uh, Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. 
long before he became the greatest, he confessed, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, I'm the best, nobody can beat me. Guess what happened? He became the best and nobody could beat him. And he retired undefeated because he believed that he was the best. Amen. So the devil is always going to get you to question what you are believing because we are created in his likeness and in his image. And God has called us to believe his word, believe his promises and to stand in faith, unimmovable, unswerving. Because God, the almighty God of this universe, think about this, he's watching over his word to perform it. For you, for me, for all of us. Amen. Amen. All right. We could go home already, right? We're not going home. All right. Thirdly, we, we saw last week, and this is kind of where we finished up last week, that he's faithful to fulfill restoration. Say restoration. God wants to restore you. Not just to how it was before the mess, the crisis, the breakup, the loss, the, 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 the beginning of that sickness or pain or shame or, or wrong turn in our lives, that thing that we took or whatever went wrong. Not just to how it was before that, but to how it should have been and would have been should there not have been any sin. Should we have been born to the perfect family? Just in our family discussion the other night, we're all talking about how, how it would have been if we were all born into the perfect family. Things would have been a whole lot better, right? But how many of you know we weren't born in the perfect family? And even when we became parents, we always strove, strived to do better and to be better. I want to be a better father than my one was. Yeah. No, no, my, my dad had wonderful strengths. He, he, was, he, he was a awesome provider, but I want to be better. I want to be a more supportive father. I want to be a more encouraging father. I want to be a a, a better example as a husband. Again, that doesn't mean my dad didn't do a good job, but I hope my kids will want to be better than me. And that's what uh, Pastor Ashley and I were speaking about. I said, we all, we, uh, all of our desires is that our kids do better than us. Right? Amen. And so, uh, but we need to know that he's faithful to restore. And it's funny because my, my daughter, Tam, the one that was singing up here uh, this morning, she was saying to the twins, uh, she said, you guys, you guys got the better version of him than what I had. It's true. You should have seen me. <laughs> you should have seen me uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago. She had a different father. Uh, I, I spanked first, and then I spoke. That's the way. Now I speak, and then I spank. Amen? So it, it, we kind of changed it up, up a little bit here and there. Amen? And so, uh, yes, so the twins have had it better. Amen? Because uh, uh, I, I just wanted things to be a certain way. And, uh, and so we, we are in a state of uh, growth. We're in a state of transformation. And so we're being restored. I'm more like Jesus today than I was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, two hours ago, 20 days ago, two days ago. I'm more like Jesus today. That's called transformation because I'm being transformed into the likeness of his image. So I'm going from strength to strength, from glory to glory. Amen? Amen? And so... uh, uh, God is busy restoring me. What life would have been like if I had a different upbringing or different parents or different or, or parents that were whole? Let me, let, let me phrase it that way. You don't want different parents, but it would be nice if they were whole. And the more whole they are, the more whole you will grow up. Amen? Think about that. So I love my parents, but I know I would have been different from the get-go if they were different. I would have been further ahead. It wouldn't have taken me 40 years to overcome certain things. It would have maybe taken me 10 years. Amen? But you know what? You think about this, especially the first generation Christians. We have fought demons that our kids won't have to fight. We fought and overcome certain things that they, 
will be no big problem to them. No biggie to them. Because you and I took care. We slew those things, man. We beat them up. We crunched them. We put them under our feet. So glad you're all excited about that. Amen. And so he's faithful to fulfill restoration. Thank you, Jesus. So we looked and we saw that the word for restoration means to be at peace, means to be complete, to be finished, to be uh, made whole or good. Nothing broken, nothing lost. It means uh, to be paid back, to be made for compensation to be made to you. All right, so we saw that last week. It means to make amends, to make restitution, and to restore reward. Ooh, hallelujah. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am being restored. Okay, so logic would say we're kind of, that's the goal, right? It's not the goal. That is, again, watch this now, part of my process. Part of my process is restoration. And a lot of Christians become Happy when there's certain areas that have been restored in their lives. Their relationship with God is restored. Their heart on fire, passionately in love with Jesus again. Or something in the family gets restored. Or their health gets restored. Or financially they get restored. There were, maybe the things, things were a mess in, in the finances or in the business. All of a sudden God is blessing. And a lot of people, watch this now. This is important because I've seen this a thousand times. A lot of people at that point lose their vision. Say vision. So God restores and begins to fulfill vision in your life. Our vision, and that's number four, there's a fulfillment of vision that we need to be living out in our lives. Restoration is one thing. For us to fulfill the vision that God has given us. Some of you, God is going to give you fresh vision. Some of you, God's going to give you a new vision because you never had vision. Some of you, He's going to encourage you to go back to where you put your vision on the shelf for you to take that vision off the shelf and to, and to see what, what part of that vision God is saying to you, get back in, get back on track, and seek first, proton, number one, the kingdom, the vasileo tothio, the rulership of Christ in your life, in, in, in your world, in your sphere of influence. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Watch this now, and then the business will be added unto you. And then God will continue to heal, to deliver, to set free, and to supply, to provide, and to bring breakthrough. Seek first the kingdom of God, the advancement of the kingdom. We, we are kings and priests, but he is the king of kings. Amen? And us as kings are here to make sure that in our sphere of influence that, and where God has called us to fulfill that vision that we are going to advance His kingdom first and foremost. His kingdom comes first. You say, well, I've got other stuff going on. Did you not hear what He said? Seek first His kingdom and all these things shall be added unto you. God will take care of the rest when you take care of what, what he's told you to seek after. And for us, a lot of times when we start experiencing some kind of restoration, our healing, our deliverance, our breakthrough financially or in the family or something comes right, all of a sudden vision is done because our vision was distracted, watch this now, by that particular thing that came and took precedence in your life. The thing that became your vision. The thing which took over the advancement of the kingdom of God. Which took over seeking first the kingdom. All of a sudden that thing 
that sickness, that pain, that shame, that, that situation in the family, in the finances, in the business, uh, whatever's go- or in our health, that thing became the vision. I've got to get myself better. Uh, because we, you see, we live in the natural. The enemy very quickly takes us out of the spiritual because vision is a spiritual thing. Vision, uh, vision is what keeps me in faith. I need faith to fulfill the vision that God has for me. Vision is not something I have. If you have it now, it's not vision. Vision is something you see and that you go towards. Woo, hallelujah. When I see it, I now can begin to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things, the husband, the wife, the breakthrough, the kids, the this, the finances, all these things shall be added unto you. Are you excited? Turn to the person next to you and say, are you ready for some revies today? Okay, so let's look at Joel chapter 2 verse 25. And we see this great powerful verse of restoration that we've either heard preached or we've had it prophesied over us. And I want you to see something very powerful. Because how many of you know full restoration doesn't happen in an instant? Full restoration is a process. As I surrender, a part of me even right with that surrender comes, comes some kind of restoration. He restores to me the power of my will when I'm restored or, or healed in a particular, with a particular habit that wasn't honoring or glorifying to the Lord. A lifestyle, a mindset, a, a something that I was feeling or doing, or maybe someone I needed to forgive and release that maybe brought a lot of pain and shame into my life. When I release that, res- I'm restored. Restoration comes into my emotions, comes into my psyche, into my mind. And that's one of the things the devil has cleverly messed with people with and, and lied to them that if you take a pill, your mental health will be healed. A pill does not heal your mental health. Jesus heals your mental health. He's the only one. He made your mind. He knows how to fix it. Amen. Amen. We saw that last week. Remember that story last week? Those of you that didn't uh, uh, watch last week, you need to watch it so you can understand it. All right. Keep reading. Verse 25. Always remember, do not take a verse and only be stuck on that verse. Read the verses before it. Or, and all read the verses after it so we can see what God is saying. The, or all of what God is saying. Verse 25. And I will restore to you. Turn to the person next to you and say, that's God's promise to me. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the great army which I sent among you. And you shall, uh, here it is now, and you shall eat in plenty. Oh, people like that. Amen. Amen. We get excited. And it is wonderful. But keep reading. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that he has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. We saw that last week. How many of you know that's an awesome promise and we all stand on that word? Keep reading, though. Don't stop reading. Keep reading. And you shall know that I am in the middle of Israel. In other words, I'm in the middle of your life. We are spiritual Israel, right? That you shall know that that I'm in the middle of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Keep reading. Look at verse 28. And. Say and. Now everybody look at me. If you went to school, uh, which I did, I at least got my third grade. They'll, they taught you. <laughs> that's supposed to be funny. They taught you that the word and takes this thought and this thought and brings it together. So whatever is going on here gets uh, 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 added or this becomes one one thought, one thought process, one activity. Keep reading. It says, and, 
And it shall come to pass, this is now the continuation, afterwards. Say afterwards. afterwards. What does afterwards mean? Afterwards. It means after, after the, uh, uh, the Lord has begun the restoration process. After he, uh, uh, he, he, you begin to eat the plenty and begin to experience satisfaction from the Lord. After that. After means? Not before. After. Keep going. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We have tried to get the spirit to be poured out on all flesh and there's been no restoration. It's a good moment to go, ooh. We wanting, oh, I want the Holy Ghost on this broken vessel that doesn't want to be healed that doesn't want to be restored, that doesn't want to experience the wholeness and the fullness of God. Afterwards, he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Keep reading. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. We talked about that last week. And your young men shall see what? Visions. Visions. Your young men (laughs) shall see visions. Now, keep reading. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. God has, a, God has a desire for us to be restored. And in that, as afterwards, once we've begun applying that in our lives, he says, I will pour out my spirit. And you're going to experience signs and wonders like never before in your life. Now... I was very, um, a, a, a friend of mine sent me some news of a, a, a man who was an amazing pastor. I started a church right here in Jacksonville many years ago, and the church exploded, as in with growth. A great teacher of the word. He taught the word, and uh, uh, he, he, he just did a great, great, awesome work for God. And um, I don't know what happened, but through some, uh, maybe 15 years later, he decided, he came from a very big church in another city. I'm not going to say where because you'll work it out where it is. He came from a big church. He decided he's going to hand over and go back. So he did that. And I was very sad to hear that the same man of God, unfortunately, and I'm seeing this, folks, especially with people and men of God who have been hurt traumatized or disillusioned in the ministry. When we hold on to that hurt, whether it's the church, the people, whatever it is as a pastor, or we're hurt in church because of whatever went on, we open the door to what's called deception. And deception came in for this wonderful amazing man of God, and he began to believe and accept what, what I call doctrine of demons. He began to believe that uh, 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 not a, no one will go to hell. There's no more hell. There's everyone's, everyone's going to heaven. He began to believe that all religions are divinely inspired. He began to believe that the Bible wasn't written by the Word of God because it has errors. He began to believe, and he believes, not began to believe, he believes it even till today, that Malcolm X, who uh, was part of and headed up the nation of Islam, is actually also a prophet of Christ. Folks, deception sets in when we lose our vision. The enemy will do everything to cause you and I to lose vision, to lose hope of the future, and And to be hurt, to be disillusioned, to be disenchanted with people, the church, the leadership, the pastor. And I know this, you'd you'd look and say, what would they be disillusioned about the pastor, right? It's a good time for y'all to get, exactly. Amen. And so it opens the door to deception. Thank God the senior pastor saw what was going on and 
obviously asked him to step down in the middle of this year. He was asked to step down and of course he went back and resumed a very powerful position of associate pastor in, in the other church, in the church that he originally came from. And he, 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 what, what else is that senior pastor going to do? He has no choice but to ask him, brother, unless you repent of these, of these teachings, these doctrine of demons, you need to leave. He wouldn't repent while well, he had to go. Folks, the enemy is out to attack the men of God, the women of God, the people of God, to attack and to remove vision from us, where we begin to, to adopt things that are so ungodly, that are so out of touch with the character and, and, and the, the, the presence of God. And it begins to consume us. One of the most powerful anointed men of God that I know that came and preached for us in South Africa. When he came, I would run to hear him because he, I won't mention his name, because he was so powerfully anointed. He adopted the same, exactly the same doctrines. He had a huge church, about maybe two or 3,000 people. And once he began to adopt this, thank God the people aren't stupid. How many of you know most of the sheep have got some brains? Because some sheep stayed. Some sheep walked with him. Folks, I don't care who stands in this pulpit. The moment somebody veers off what God's word says, run. Amen. Amen. Especially when it comes to major things of doctrine. I'm not talking about small little what we call minors. Is Jesus coming back before, mid, post, before any? That's all minors. Amen. Time will tell and you all will see that I'm right. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to who is Jesus Christ, does the blood of Jesus wash us and cleanse us? Is there salvation in Jesus' name? Is there heaven or hell? These are all majors. This is what the Bible speaks about. Now, let me tell you something. God doesn't send anyone to hell. Amen. I'm going to say that again. God sends nobody to hell. Their unbelief sends them to hell. God has made a way. How much more must he do? He sends, he sends nobody to hell. Any human's unbelief is what sends them to hell. Let's get back to the subject of vision. Amen? But, but it is important for us to see what happens to us when we lose our vision. That the enemy comes in and robs us and is able to actually rob us, watch this, of our destiny. Of our future. We need to stay firm. We need to stay established. Rooted in God's word. Amen. And the Bible says in Proverbs 29 verse 18. Where there is no vision. The people cast off restraint. Or the people perish. The Bible says. This word perish or cast off restraint. Is the Hebrew word para. Say with me para. And it means to let loose, to let go. They show lack of restraint. They got, they got no, they got no, nothing controlling them. No reins in their lives. The people who lose their vision just live their life, and wh whatever comes happens. Wh whatever I want to do, I do, and they just, they, they're just running around and getting nowhere in life. We need vision to keep us. Uh, um, uh, focused to keep us moving in the same direction, to keep us doing what God wants us to do, to fulfill the will and the plan of God for our lives. And God has given us vision beginning with seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Amen. Listen to this powerful story. About 350 years ago, a shipload of travelers landed on the northeast coast of America. The first year, they established a town site. The next year, they elected a town government. The third year, the town government planned to build a road five miles westward into the wilderness. Westward, into the wilderness. In the fourth year, the people tried to impeach their town government because they thought it was a waste of public funds to build a road five miles westward. 
into a wilderness. Who needed to go there anyway? Here were a people who had vision to cross an ocean 3,000 miles and to overcome great hardships to get here, to get there. But in a few years, they weren't able to see even five miles out of town. They had lost their pioneering vision. The church has lost its pioneering vision. With a clear vision of what we can become in Christ, no ocean of difficulty is too great. Without it, we rarely move beyond our current boundaries. Folks, we need to get our vision back. The devil steals vision. Say with me, devil, I take back my vision. In the name of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and I take Take it back by force right now. I get my vision back. Come on now. Hold on to your vision. Give the Lord a praise offering. You just got your vision back. So glad you're all excited about that. You know, a lot of people, once they get to their promised land, now they're on their father's yacht. It's like us. We could have done that, and we're not going to do it. If you're looking to be comfortable now that we have a lovely building, beautiful property, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> I'm not that guy. Sorry. Find, you, you're going to have to find somebody else. But I'm, I'm here now, so you're not finding anybody if you're in this building. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because you know what? We're not just here to, to occupy. We, we're here to advance. We're here to advance the kingdom. We're going to advance things. We're going we, we, to create a kid heaven. Our, we, we're we're going to relaunch Impact Youth, which is going to once again be the spearhead of, of, of ministry here at City Bible Church. We're going to do some stuff here in this next year. You, you, you don't get off the train because the train will not come back in this direction. You, it's going to be hard for you to catch it. You're going to have to catch a spe high-speed rail to find us down there. I knew somebody that... That uh, the Lord led to another ministry, and and he, he wrote to me one day. He said, "You know what? Uh, uh, I thank you for all that you did for me. My wife and I grew. Actually, they met in our church. We married them." He said, "We grew, but one thing I love about City Bible Church," he said, "we were stretched. We grew." And one thing I realized: if I got off the train station at the train station and I and I waited too long, the train was gone. So folks, stay with us on the train. Let's keep going. Let's keep advancing the kingdom of God. We need, to, we need to take dominion. We need to take background. We need to displace Satan. We need to bind uh, him from carrying out his assignments in our city, in our state, in our nation. And also to loose his influence off of the minds on, and the bodies and the hearts of God's people Amen. in our city. Folks, we don't need... I'm all for, and you all know, I, I, I've got a heart for Europe. I've got a heart for Africa. But folks, we've got our own mission station. As you step outside, you go off the steps, you're in your mission field. Hallelujah. We have lots of mission work to do right here. Amen? Somebody once said, what makes people work is an idea worth working for, along with a clear understanding of what needs to be done. Amen? Uh, Robert Schuller said, when you set no goals for growth, you set your goals for no growth. You know what, folks? If we have seen uh, uh, further, it's because we have been standing on the shoulders of those who have come before us. And so we need to know that we need to build upon those who were here before us, those who have gone before us, the Smith Wigglesworths, all the, the Reinhold Bonkers, those that we've always looked up to. Well, let's build from there. Let's not look back and say, oh, the good old days. No, the good old days are ahead. The good old days is what we're going to, the faith that they had, I'm going to have the same faith. Did you know that Reinhold Bonke? For many years, he struggled to get 50 people, 5-0, 50 people into his services. 
For years, he couldn't get 50 people. And the same guy, just by being faithful, just by knowing the faithfulness of God, kept pressing in, kept his vision that God had shown him all those years, preached to 7 million people in one service. 7 million. Folks, that's a lot of people. You can't see the end. Seven million people just in Nigeria. Sorry, it was seven million people, but 1.6 million. Sorry, it was 1.6 million in that one service that they show you. They pan across. You can't see the end. They needed something like 15 jumbo jets to carry the sound equipment so that the dude that you can't see right down there in the field could hear what was being preached. And they harvested, in that, in that one service, they harvested one million souls in that one service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We had the honor and privilege of knowing him in South Africa, working alongside him. And I tell you what, what a man of faith and the most loving, wonderful, amazing man of God that you'll ever meet. Amen? In one church in England, the elders spent... The best part of two board meetings, five hours from 7 p.m. to discuss whether to change the bulbs in the sanctuary from 60 watts to 100 watts. What a waste of two board meetings, five hours each. Folks, it's about souls, not about... Folks, Jacksonville is ours. Doesn't belong to the devil, doesn't belong to any, any group of, of, of any woke situation. It belongs to Jesus. This, this city belongs to Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but there's a great man that we were once uh, very, um, uh, we were a whole lot more uh, 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 in relationship with them. He had the biggest church in South Korea. His name at the time was Paul Yonggi Cho. I think he's changed it to David Yonggi Cho now, his name. And he, when he flew to America, he was on the plane and God showed him a vision. I didn't know this. I was ecstatic. We were actually interviewing. Uh, we used to be uh, on TBN uh, interviewing different people. And we used to host a show, a two-hour show. For many years we did that. And, um, and we uh, uh, interviewed someone who knew him personally. So he's flying to Jacksonville to do a meeting with a whole lot of pastors. Uh, no, he was flying to America. He had no, no one told him about Jacksonville. And the Lord shows him a vision. Listen to this. Now, this is what this dude's telling me. Because I, my question to Jesus was, oh, God, why Jacksonville? <laughs> you must remember, I come from a big city, millions of people, uh, you know, I can go on and on. And there was a whole lot of sin. And when I got here, the, the, the most exciting thing that was happening was that I was meeting almost everyone I met went to the big Baptist church downtown. And I thought, oh God, how big is this church? The whole city goes there. Why, Lord, why would you send me to a city that's already religious and, and I'm, I'm not that guy. Give me broken people. Give me sinners. I, Lord, that's what I'm used to. And then this guy that I'm interviewing says to me, and so he's on the plane. And you, you know, if you know anything about Yon, Paul Yonggi Cho, he was a tremendous man of prayer. He knew how to pray. We're, talking, we're not talking about praying for 10 minutes or an hour or two hours. He would spend seven, eight hours a day in prayer. And uh, if there's anything in our relationship with him it, that we learned was to pray, especially to pray in the Spirit for hours in a, a day. And I want to encourage you to get to that. But anyway, he's in prayer and he's on the plane and the Lord gives him a vision. And it was of a big wave coming towards America. And he's looking in the vision and he sees a little dot a city, Jacksonville. He had never heard the word Jacksonville in his life before. Jacksonville, Florida. 
And he says, the first city that was hit by this wave was Jacksonville, Florida. You know what, folks? We can sit back and say, okay, well, let's, ha- let's find ourselves a man of God to lead us in this revival. Or we can say, oh, God, we're going to seek first your kingdom. We're going we, to press in. We are going to be your people that are going to walk in, receive, spearhead, be part of the cutting edge of what you're doing in our city and in our nation. I'm so glad you're all excited about that. I'm not waiting for nobody. Because last time I looked, God is not a respecter of persons. Amen. And God will do it for us. If we seek him, we will find him. Amen. Amen. When we seek him with all of our heart. Now, we seek first the advancement, the vasileo dotheo, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Number one, that means to uh, write these points down. That means to preach the gospel in our city and to fill. Let's begin. We're filling this building with souls. And we may have to go into two services. And when we do that, we're going to build our, our, next, our next new building. Amen. If that's what God has for us, or get another building. Either way, God's going to lead us at that time. Probably use this beautiful property and use it to its full potential. Amen. Amen. So we're going to, uh, I, I want to see this place packed. And I, I love our, I mean, folks, I'm so young myself, but I want to see this place packed with young people on fire for Jesus. People who are passionate. People who are full of the fire of God for Jesus. And folks, that's not going to happen when we just keep doing things the way we've done it all the time. We keep doing it all the same way we've done it, we'll get the same results. How many of you know we're about to kick into a different gear? This message is kicking this church into a different gear. If you drive a car, you know when it goes, uh, 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 every time it goes, uh, you, you're going faster. Pastor, how much more change can we take until we fulfill the vision God has given us? We're going to keep going. We're going to keep taking ground. We're going to keep advancing. We're going to keep binding, loosing, and we're going to keep doing what we need to do. Folks. Right now, there's work going on in the back to create soccer fields and sports stuff for our young people. Oh, we're doing stuff. Amen? There's stuff that can be done that doesn't require money. We're doing what needs to be done, and then the money will follow. Hallelujah. For us to do what we need to do. So we're going to relaunch our youth and our young adults ministry. Once again, these will be God's mighty weapon in His hand. Number three, we're going to raise up our children's ministry. The children of this body are going to be those who lay hands on their teachers, who bring Jesus into their schools, or those who know how to pray, those who know how to pray in the Spirit, those who know how to... How to believe God for impossible situations. Those will be the mouthpiece of God even to their parents in their homes. That's, what's, that's the children we are raising up in the back. We're not just babysitting and putting on a video so that they, just to get rid of the kids so that y'all can uh, enjoy a good service. They are being trained. They are being equipped for life. They're being equipped what to do when, when peer pressure comes, when the big bullies come. They're being trained what to do, how to handle themselves. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Our young people are not those that are going to cower and move into a place of failure and defeat and hide and hope to be obscure somehow. Amen? The Bible says, the children, the people that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. I, 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 I'm believing that these words I'm speaking is building vision in your heart, that you're capturing the vision that's even within me for our city, for our, for our, for what God has called City Bible Church to do. You know, folks, I can't answer for the other churches, the other pastors. May, may they fulfill the vision God has given them. That's what I pray. When I see another church prosper, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. When I see them grow, when I see them doing great things for God, I, I'm blessed. Amen? Amen. Bible says, that they know their God shall be strong 
our kids will be strong and do great exploits. Folks, if we don't teach, if we don't get to our kids, the devil will. Come on now. If we don't get to our young people, the devil will. He's got an agenda, not just in our city, but in our nation. And if you haven't seen it come to pass, then you're blind and you're deaf. There's something wrong. Come on, we need to open our eyes and instead of going, oh, look what's happening. The world's going down the drain. Let's become part of the solution. Jesus is the answer to the kids, to the young people, to the young adults. Jesus is their answer. To the drug addicts, to the down and out, Jesus is the answer. And if we're not going to be Jesus to them, they'll never know who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Come on, church. We need to wake up. You, when you go into that, into that situation, you are the face of Jesus to that person. You're the, you, you're the voice of Jesus to that person. You're the hands of Jesus to that person. They don't see Jesus. They see Jesus in you. They hear Jesus coming out of your mouth. How much he loves them, cares for them. There's enough voices out there. God hates you. He's, he's sending you to hell. There's enough nonsense. And then on top of it, the devil's busy having a headache condemning them in their, in their heads. We need to be, for God so loved you that he gave you Jesus. That as you believe in him, you won't perish, but you'll have eternal life. The gift of God has come to you. Receive that gift and you will receive eternal life. Vision is the capacity to create a compelling picture of the desired state of affairs that inspires people to respond. You see, a God vision will invoke a response on our part. When you have vision, it's not just a vision that keeps you happy and goosebumps and excited. No, it, 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 it creates something in you that I have to respond to fulfill this vision. Let me tell you something. You all heard me talk about this a week or two ago. When God gave us a vision for the United States, the hardest thing he ever asked me was asked for me at that point. And the hardest thing was I had to leave two of my kids to come and begin a life here with a promise from God that he would bring my children to me. How many of you know you've got to believe God? How many, now, I'm, I'm not, please, I'm not trying to be a hero here. But either God gave me a vision or he didn't. He showed me what he was going to do. And we, we're not there yet, so I'm not going anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We still got a lot to do. Amen. As I sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he added everything Hallelujah. to me. His promises came to pass just a week ago. You all were part of the seeing the Lord restoring, bringing our daughter, grandchildren, son-in-law, all coming to live and, and, and serve God with us here in Jacksonville. Amen. Amen? Amen? Keep reading. To respond, that which is desirable, which could be, should be, that which is attainable. A godly vision is right for the times, right for the church, and right for the people. A godly vision promotes faith rather than fear. A godly vision motivates people to action. A godly vision requires risk-taking. How many of you know if we never take a risk, if Peter never took a risk when Jesus said, come, he would have still been in the boat. We wouldn't have heard about this. Or we would have heard, yeah, Jesus said, let me come, come. Huh? Physics. I did physics at school. I'm going to sink. What do you mean come? I don't see. I don't see naturally. I don't see anything solid. I just see water. It, vision involves risk. We need to step out in faith. We need to do what God says. We need to serve, put our shoulder to the plow. 
Some of us have been through some traumatic situations in previous churches, previous situations, previous pastors, whatever. You know what, folks? I'm sorry. And I haven't been perfect myself. I know it's hard for you to believe. And I'm sure there's been at least one person in 25 years that's left our church because they were disenchanted with me, the pastor. And that's, you know, it is what it is. And I'm sorry that that has happened. No pastor wakes up, I want you to know, no pastor wakes up one, one morning and goes, how can I irritate and, and disillusion God's people? Nobody wakes up like that, right? Everyone's doing in their minds, in their hearts, what they believe is the right thing. Sometimes it's right to you, and sometimes maybe it's like, hmm, is he sure? Are we, is he really hearing from God, Right? And that's when trust comes in. Imagine, can you imagine how scared the Israelites must have been? They had never been out of Egypt. That generation had never seen the areas of ground that were taken, even going towards the Red Sea. They had never seen that. They had never been down that road. They had only heard of the promised land, the land of milk and honey. How do they know it even exists? And yet... They trusted the word of a man who said, I have heard from God. Let's go. There's better for us. Don't sit thinking about the leeks and the onions of the, of the Egyptians. We need to go to the land of milk and honey. Folks, if they had no trust, they would have stayed right there. Real quiet here this morning. We've got to get to a place, folks. I know. Maybe we would hurt, disillusioned, whatever. But let's, let's put our shoulder to the plow to, today. Let's get our vision back. All you got to do, watch this now. All you got to do is with my vision is like this. Within this vision is your vision, which may be here, 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 or whatever. All you got to do all you are responsible for is doing what God has told you to do. You keep your eye on your vision, I'll keep my eye on mine. How about that? Amen. Is that a good idea? Amen. But you know what your problem is and what our problem is? Let me check to make sure that Jason is fulfilling his vision. Let Jason work out his own salvation. The same Holy Spirit that gives you a slap upside your head when you have gone off track is the same Holy Spirit that will... You're okay, Jace. You're on track. You're fulfilling the vision. Amen? The same Holy Spirit. We sit being, watch, the devil takes our eyes off the vision and puts it on man. So that you no longer walk and live according to the vision that God has given you. Be aware of the devices of the enemy. He will pull out every trick in the book. Greater men and women than you and I have fallen to his tricks. So don't think it can't happen to you. Much greater people than you and I. Come on now. Woo, hallelujah. A godly vision glorifies God, not people. Number four, we need to build up our training and equipping center to equip impart, activate, and launch men and women of all ages actively into ministry, into society, into business. I want our young people to become the successful business people of our city and of our nation. Why does it have to be some dude by the name of Musk? How about somebody with the name of Tyler. Blom. Willits. Somebody with your name. That, that was trained and equipped for success in the house of God. And you, your house too. Don't, don't palm off your responsibility to us. We'll do our job, you do yours. Amen? Amen? You know, sometimes like, oh, the church will take care of No, you need to have a godly home in your own home. You need to be praying. You need to be 
bringing, keeping Jesus in your home. Amen. His presence in your home. Of course, we're going to complete our kitchen, which is going to help us to enjoy our fellowship area that we're busy working on right now even more. Amen? We're going to get a new LED screen because this one is shaking and doing weird stuff. We're going to get our new LED screen. Amen? I'm believing that this next year is our year to upgrade our bathrooms, to complete our fellowship picnic area in the back with our own soccer field basketball, uh, uh, volleyball uh, court, and basketball. Amen. Our youth center, we're going to turn this whole, this wing is going to change. It's no longer going to be storage. People should not be seeing storage when they drive past. They need to see the youth center when they drive past. It must say, City Bible Church Youth Center. Hallelujah. They must know there's stuff going on here. So guess what? That storage is moving. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Come on, church. It's going to take some elbow grease. Amen. Some of us can do with some exercise. So there's a good place to come and do it is right here in church. Amen. So glad you're all excited and you're all agreeing with me on this. How much time do I have? I could go on. I've got so much vision going on. Ooh. We're coming in for landing, people. <laughs> Folks, Jacksonville's ours. I don't want to be a little candle. We're here to be a, a lighthouse. Lighthouse brings direction. Shows you where you're at. Shows you where the rocks are. Shows you where to go. That's what a lighthouse does. We need to set uh, 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 we need to set vision once again ahead of us. Okay, there we go. I found, just found my place. We need, we're going to be launching our marriage ministry, our divorced and widows ministry. We're going to be relaunching our senior ministry. And we're going to believe for a ministry that ministers to those that are uh, uh, sexually disorientated. Amen. I don't want to be sitting condemning people. We need to be part of the solution to people that are struggling, amen, with certain areas in their lives. We can sit condemning them all day long. And unless we're going to be part of the solution, shut your mouth. Jesus didn't come. If, if anyone had a reason to condemn all of us, it was Jesus. But what did he do? He chose to come and to be part of the solution for, for us, for what we, what we needed. Amen. All right. So now that we got that out of the way. Then we need to strategically plan and pierce Europe and South America and Africa with the light of his gospel. Amen. Amen. And Asia. I know we have a lot of some people watching us in Asia. Amen? Amen. But right now the Lord is opening doors for us in Europe. He's opening doors for us in Africa. He's opening uh, doors for us right here in the United States. We need to be where the doors are opening. We need to be walking through. Amen? Amen. I'm, I'm very blessed that the Lord's uh, even opening doors in Israel. Amen? We have, we have beautiful Palestinian people that watch us. We have, we have Jewish people that watch us in Israel right now. Isn't that exciting? Yes. Folks, they need truth, the truth of the gospel. They don't need someone giving a political agenda. They need the only one who can fix that problem, Jesus. Amen? Amen. We are going to release his anointing and the restoration that's happening in us, we're going to release it to the world. Amen? Amen? Vision is the ability to understand. Oh, we've already said that. <laughs> All right. I was. Okay, let's. Last scripture Ezekiel 47. One of the most, I've preached on this so many times, I cannot tell you, over the last 43 years, 43, 44 years. I never saw this revelation. And it was always there. How many of you know revelation isn't something I make up? Revelation is something that's there that all of a sudden you look at, wow, why didn't I see that? 
That's revelation. It's not something that I make up. It's something that was there, but we just never saw it. This is the vision of Ezekiel. And you remember the river. Watch this now. I never saw this. The man brought me back. This is the angel that's giving him the angel. Some believe it was Jesus that's giving him the vision. Brought him back to the entrance uh, of the temple. Say with me, the entrance of the temple. Where's the temple? Who's the temple? We are. Okay. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. So the water, notice it didn't say the river. It's only talking about the water. Keep reading. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple. Oh, hallelujah, we're in the south side. Isn't God good? Strategically placed us on the south side, hallelujah. South of the altar, he brought me out through the north gate and led me through the outside of the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cupids that, that, and then led me through the water, through the what? Through the water that was ankle deep. Now we all know that he, he goes on and it says he measured off another thousand cubits and he led me to knee deep. He measured off another thousand and he led me to that which is waist deep. He measured another thousand cubits. Now, so up to, up to waist deep, it's water. Say water. water. Right? And you're going, it, you remember when Jesus said, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. In another portion of scripture, it says, and out of, uh, 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 therefore with joy, you will draw water out of the wells of salvation. So the water he's talking about is that which we drink. So he's basically saying, drink not just till you ankle deep, not just till you're knee deep, not just till you waist deep, but keep drinking, keep going deeper, keep pressing in, keep seeking first the kingdom of God, keep pressing in. The water is that which is, which is coming from the temple. Put your hand on your chest, on your tummy and say, from the temple, from me. So the water in the temple goes from ankle deep to knee deep to waist deep. Do you see that? And then he it doesn't end there. He says, listen, and he measured off another thousand. And, 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 but now it was a river. Now it was a river. It wasn't a river before. Didn't Jesus say, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me drink. And then out of his innermost being shall flow what? The river only becomes a river when we've pressed in. We've got knee, uh, uh, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and I just keep going. I keep pressing in. I don't give up. Then the water which I'm drinking for myself, I'm drawing water out of the wells of salvation, all of a sudden becomes more than it. All of a sudden, boom, rivers of living water begin to flow out of me, Amen. out of you. Notice the progression. It ain't going to happen because you're cute, which you are. It's going to happen because you're pressing in. It's going to happen because you're going deeper. It's going to happen because you're taking ground. It's going to happen because you're being restored. Because the goal is for you to have the river of God flowing out of you. Because when you get out there and that river flows, whatever, keep reading. I, the pastor's not going to make this up. Keep going because it says, uh, because the water has risen and was deep enough to swim in the river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back on the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw all trees. Oh man, trees are drinking from this water on each side of the river. He said to me, the water flows toward the eastern region and goes down the Araba and where it enters the Dead Sea. How many of you know we have a Dead Sea in front of us? The Bible says the people without Christ are dead in their trespasses and sins. Wherever the river flows, 
Whatever the river touches. Keep reading. Ah. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this river flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything, say everything. Everything Everything will live. The business will live. The family will live. The situation will live. The person that's addicted will come alive again. and will be free of their addictions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll begin to live again. It's not going to happen with Jesus. Folks, Jesus is showing up in you and through you. you, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep going. Let's go down to verse 12. Fruit trees and all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fall, fail, Every month they will bear fruit because of the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Ooh, hallelujah. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Mm. I've got so much going on here, but I'm going to end off. You may close your Bibles. I've told a story before some time back. Like so many evenings, mom and dad were home and Jimmy was playing on the floor after dinner, and mom and dad were absorbed with jobs, and they didn't notice at the time what, so much what he was doing. So mom glanced at the clock, Jimmy, she said, it's time to go to bed. Go up now, and I'll come and settle you later. Unlike usual, Jimmy went up, up the steps towards his room. An hour or so later, mom went up, to check if all was well, and to her astonishment, she found her son. He was staring quietly out of his window at the moonlit scenery, for it was full moon that night. What are you doing, Jimmy? I'm looking at the moon, Mom. Well, it's time to go to bed now. As one reluctant boy settled down, he said, Mommy, you know, one day I'm going to walk on the moon. Who could have known? That that boy in whom the dream was planted that night, he would survive a near-fatal motorbike crash, which broke almost every bone in his body, and would bring to fruition his dream 32 years later, when James Irwin stepped on the moon's surface, just one of the 12 representatives of the human race to have done so. A great man once said, I have a dream. Let's bow our heads before the Lord. What is your dream? You know what, folks? We're going to break bread. I want you to get your cup. Open it to the bread. Because let me tell you, the restoration and the vision and The call that God has placed on your life did not come cheap. It was free.